<laughs> For those of you who didn't meet me last night, I'm Natasha Chernesky. I work at Microsoft. Everybody calls me Nacho. Feel free to call me Nacho. That's my alias at Microsoft. So you can always email me at uh, nacho at Microsoft.com. Um, I'm here along with Casey Champion. Casey, <laughs> stand up, wave. Uh, we work on the academic team at Microsoft, and uh, we usually design curriculum for computer science. Uh, in the case of looking to design computer science curriculum for high school students, we said, why are we gonna design something when we can't possibly compete with this man here? So we said, let's get together and figure out how we can help Professor Malin take his course to students all around the globe. And really our role at Microsoft is just to support and amplify Professor Malin and his team's efforts and to support and amplify everyone's efforts in this room. And on behalf of Microsoft, I'd just like to say thank you for all of the hard work that you do teaching computer science. I personally had the opportunity to read everybody's bio and application and to talk to most of you on the phone. And I can say with just um, complete reverence and confidence that there's a lot of talent in this room. And I encourage you uh, today and tomorrow to get to know everybody in this room. And really, you're becoming part of the CS50 AP community. And it's an awesome, awesome experience. So on behalf of Microsoft, welcome. And if there's anything I can do over the course of the weekend or afterward to help you and uh, just help you be successful in, with your students in class, let me know. Don't ever hesitate to reach out. People reach out all the time. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Zamila. Thanks, Nacho. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Zamila. Many of you may know me uh, from the face talking to you from the walkthrough screen. I really enjoy doing the walkthroughs because they're a chance to give tips and sort of get students unstuck and help those that might be often less comfortable with computer science say, you know what, actually, I can think about these problems if I break them into these puzzle pieces. So I love doing the walkthroughs and I love meeting people who watch the walkthroughs. So uh, definitely do say hi over the course of this weekend. My involvement on CS50 staff, um, I think I've been on staff for six years now, um, but my engagement with CS50 actually started in high school when my high school teacher supplemented our programming course with some materials from CS50 from iTunes, um, iTunes University Open Courseware. Um, and so indeed, I think this has been quite in line with CS50's, um, CS50's um, spirit, really, of accessibility of this com amazing computer science course, and it's only grown from there now to involve a whole community of professor of teachers and I think we have a map of where all of these high school teachers are coming from like yourselves participating in CS50 AP so I think the community of teachers and the community of students of high school students um, particularly particularly young girls interested in computer science is really amazing so I definitely encourage you to make connections with your fellow colleagues here today um, and definitely enjoy this weekend with that I turn it over to Doug thanks Zamila. Zamila is always a tough act to follow <laughs> um, I met many of you last night but for those of you who don't know me my name is Doug Lloyd uh, within CS50 I run the CS50 AP program so you've probably gotten some emails from me and you're sure to get many more as we'll uh, talk back and forth over the coming uh, weeks and months I'm really excited to have you all here. This is a really amazing initiative and it's so great to see this taking shape in high schools now. Uh, and I can't wait to see what we can all do together uh, in the coming uh, year as well. Uh, behind me is going to be a, this is the schedule for the day just to give you a rundown of what we're gonna do. It's obviously a, a pretty full day. We're gonna start out with, uh, with David giving you a, a sense of what CS, the CS50 experience is all about. I'll uh, take a quick break and then we'll dive into what what the CS50 curriculum or what CS50 in a box is. What do you get with this curriculum, which is of course available for free, but not just the curriculum itself, what other tools, resources are available to you to incorporate into your classroom for your students. Then we'll take a, we'll take a break for lunch. We'll show you the CS50 office and we'll have a chance to um, introduce one another. Uh, yesterday you had a chance to meet many of us, uh, but we haven't had a chance to meet all of you and have uh, everybody introduce one another. So hopefully we'll have a chance to do that over lunch. We'll come back, talk a little bit more about um, the curriculum itself, how it maps to the AP Computer Science Principles Framework, that purple book that you all might have seen that yesterday got even bigger. They released a new version of it. <laughs> so we'll try and get those updates in there as well. Talk about creating a CS50 culture. Uh, give you a tour of the Harvard campus. Um, it's a really um, cool place to be, and so hopefully you'll get a chance to see that. And fingers crossed, we'll have a chance to show you where CS50 actually happens live in Sanders Theater. Uh, then we'll go out to dinner and uh, give you a sense afterwards of the programming environment that we use in the course. So that's sort of the quick rundown for the day. 
If at any point during the day you have questions, anytime, there's a Google form live for you to just visit and type anything you want to, thoughts, questions, comments, anything like that. Uh, and tomorrow morning in particular, we're going to have a Q&A session where we'll go through some of the most commonly asked questions and, um, of course, take questions live from you. But without further ado, I want to pass it off to uh, David Malin. Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you. So the, among the goals this morning is to give everyone a taste of what we aspire to do in CS50 and to have a bit of a meta discussion so as to rather than teach material with which most everyone uh, is probably all too familiar uh, to try to give you a higher level sense of why we do some of the things we do and how we set the stage at the start of the semester. Um, we've been super excited about APCS principles because for some time I dare say that courses like APCSA have been very language centric if not syntax specific and one of the goals of APCS principles is really to provide students with a a higher level appreciation of, the applicability of, the relevance of, uh, the excitement of computer science. And indeed, at the start of CS50, we try to give students a taste of exactly that. Um, we introduce students in the very first lecture to a number of ideas, among them computational thinking. Um, and that's one of the topics from which we'll cherry pick uh, some of the incarnations of that today, involving as many of you as we can. Uh, but before then, I thought I would hit play on this. CS50 over time has uh, uh, adopted uh, a sense of theatrics perhaps, um, whereby our production team now, Dan and Scully and Ramon and Ian, whom you might have met last night, um, and our undergraduate team have done a wonderful job at capturing uh, the culture, for instance, of CS50. In fact, that started very organically. Someone just happened to take some photographs in 2008 of this very first CS50 fair, and it sort of dawned on me, wow, that was a good idea. And so now we've actually very much embraced that, and we would encourage you in turn two, if comfortable in your own schools, capturing those kinds of memories, because we found in years I plus one and I plus two, it's a wonderful um, capturing of years past to paint a picture for students of their students who look like them, who've taken the class before, friends of theirs, to help get them excited. And so what you're about to see is a sizzle reel of sorts that will debut in just a few weeks at Harvard's Visitas weekend, or Prefrosh weekend for the incoming freshman class. Uh, and you'll see some familiar hands and faces before you here. But no audio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're off to such a smooth start otherwise. There we go. Let's try this again. Without further ado. CS50, Harvard University's introduction to the intellectual enterprises of computer science and the art of programming. If you walked in here today, you'd see hundreds of people crowded around their laptops, smiling, laughing, thinking. So that is pretty much the first visuals and the first things students see and hear in CS50. And then we very quickly launch into what we hope is a, a teaser for the kinds of ideas that we'll explore over the course of the semester. And for instance, we first talk to students about computational thinking or algorithmic thinking. And over the years, I've thought about how best to sort of distill that idea into familiar ideas that students can quickly wrap their minds around. And at the risk of oversimplifying, what we typically say is that computation, uh, computational thinking is the result of taking inputs, so some problem to be solved, passing it into something called an algorithm or a set of instructions for solving some problem, a black box into which you can produce in, uh, send inputs and out of which come outputs or solutions. And using these three ideas, do we then very quickly transition to a question of, well, inputs and outputs, what does that really mean? Well, everyone in the room, um, young and old, in a classroom typically knows that computers somehow use zeros and ones, even if they've never really thought hard about what that might mean. And it turns out that even though computers only understand zeros and ones and speak binary, so to speak, 
that's actually not all that dissimilar from what we all learn in like grade school in terms of how to represent information using numbers. It just so happens that in the binary system, of course, we only have zeros and ones instead of zeros through nines. So one of the first questions we ask students is if you have a much more limited vocabulary. In fact, at the end of the day, a computer is a fairly primitive, dumb device. It only does what a human tells it to do, and the only input to it is really some form of electricity, sort of uh, electrons flowing in and out of the computer. So how do you turn something so basic as that into something useful. Well, let's consider what we humans have done probably since grade school. Um, if you have a number with which uh, we've been familiar for years, like 123, well, why is that number 123? Well, these are just symbols. We know them as numbers now, but they're just kind of shapes on the board, but they have meaning. And in fact, the way I learned how to count, and in fact, let me toss this up here instead, the way I learned how to count, though it took me a while to sort of remember the basics, is that if you have a number like 123, well, that's because I was taught this is the ones place, this is the, two, uh, this is the tens place, spoiler, <laughs> this is the, <laughs> Uh, hundreds place there, or the ones column, the tens column, the hundreds columns. So why is that relevant? Well, this is just a three. And what I was taught way back when is that uh, if the three is in the ones place, you have three times one equals, uh, well, actually, let's work from the other side. So if you have a one in the hundreds place, that's like saying you have a hundred times one. And then if you have a two in the tens place, that's like saying you have ten times two. And then if you have a three in the ones place, that's like saying one times three. And if I just do this math now, this is 100, this is 20, this is three, and oh, that's why it's the number we know as 123. And we try to go through this process fairly quickly because we don't want to send in the very first day of the course, um, at least in our case, a message that CS is all about math. In fact, that may very well be a valuable skill to have coming in, but we don't want to overemphasize that. So we very quickly now transition to what people would call binary, where now you have maybe three placeholders like this, but the columns are just a little different. The ones place, the twos place, as you saw earlier, and the fours place. So by the same logic, if a computer has inside of its brain 0, 0, 0, even if you've never seen binary before, we ask students, what does this probably represent? It's just 0, because it's 0 times 4 plus 0 times 2 plus 0 times 1. So that, of course, is just 0. And now we can make things more interesting. How might a computer represent the number we know as 1? Well, you just need a hash mark in the ones column. And now there's an interesting opportunity for students perhaps to sort of deliberately mislead. Well, then a two, of course, is represented like this. We just need a hash mark in the twos place. And then hopefully someone at this point is like, wait a minute, that's not quite right. We instead just change this zero to a one, but the other one to a zero. Why? It's starting to look perhaps a little cryptic. But again, the basics are the same as grade school. Zero times four plus one times two plus 0 times 1 now gives us 2. And so now is an opportunity. Why don't we skip ahead? Uh, how might we quickly represent the number 15 in binary? 15 in binary. 1, 1, 1, 1. All right, so we wouldn't necessarily escalate that quickly, but wouldn't want to dwell today on some of the steps in between. But there's a fun opportunity certainly here for us in class to have students actually come up to do this or to sort of uh, involve most every student as we count up. But this is all fairly dry. And in fact, I'm literally using a piece of chalk and a chalkboard. How can we make this a little more relevant to the electronic device that we alluded to earlier? Well, instead here, we have maybe these physical devices. So these are, of course, just little desk lamps. They've got light bulbs on the inside. And if you consider that inside of a computer is millions of things that you've probably heard of before, transistors, even if you don't really understand as a young student the electronics, a transistor is just a switch. It can be turned on and it can be turned off. And if it's on, that generally means that something represents what we'll call on or a one or true. And if there's no electricity, that's the absence of electricity, we'll call it false or zero or off. And so if you now think of these three desk lamps as really big transistors, really big switches, and there just happens to be millions of them inside of my laptop, well, now we can do the same thing. If a computer has three transistors inside of it, how would it represent a one? Which of these lights needs to be turned on? Yeah, so uh, one, zero, or zero, zero, one, if we read from left to right. Absolutely. So now we just have a one. And of course, if we want to represent a two, we do this. A three is this. And a five is 
One, one. Yeah, so one, zero, one. So this is perhaps a little more playful incarnation of what we have here, but that's it. Now, how does a computer count above, let's see, what's the largest number we can express here? If this is the fours plus the twos plus the ones, so seven. So seven, how does a computer then represent bigger numbers? Can a computer only speak zero through seven? No, we just need another lamp. We need to add another lamp over here, and then a computer might have another lamp over here. And in fact, some of you might know the concept of a byte being eight bits. Well, it turns out that a zero or one is just a bit, a binary digit. And so a computer typically, at least humans typically talk about computers' unit of measure as a byte. That just means you typically talk about eight desk lamps at a time. And so a computer, of course, ends up having millions of these little switches that you can operate. But now at least we have a connection to what we probably all were very familiar familiar with before. And so now we can introduce for the very first time abstraction. And we might not call it by this word or I might whiz over it pretty quickly, but this idea now of taking for granted that this computer can somehow count and just by adding more of these switches or desk lamps we can count as high as we want. Why is that information useful? It would seem that a computer is just a calculator that it can only do things with numbers, but not indeed so. If we instead just agree as humanity to assign letters, a higher level concept, if you will, to numbers, we can arbitrarily but globally consistently say that if you're representing the number 65, you're representing a capital A. If you're representing the number 90, that should be interpreted as a capital Z. And we can do similar patterns for the number 123 or any other numbers. And in fact, this ASCII system is a standard way of computers representing characters on the screen. But this too would seem to limit a computer. Most of us do far more today with our computers than just numbers and just letters. We have sounds, we have videos, we have graphics. And so it's an opportunity to consider then how we might represent higher level concepts. In fact, as a little quick quiz, what might this represent? Uh, maybe a color could represent a color, maybe a fairly uh, simply expressed color. And indeed we can, but it depends on the context. And in fact, one of the common questions up front is that if all of a computer has is zeros and ones that might be numbers, might be letters, might be colors, well, how does a computer distinguish? And what we would point out at this point, that it's just context dependent. And we deliberately oversimplify. And if we say something like, if you're in Microsoft Word or TextEdit or Notepad, the context there is characters. And so those zeros and ones are going to be interpreted as letters of the alphabet. If you're instead in in Adobe Photoshop or Mac Paint or Windows, uh, uh, the Windows equivalent, well, then you have the paint tool, well, then it's going to be interpreted as colors. Again, an oversimplification, but it allows us to point out that in one context, 72, 73, 33 might represent high textually. It might also represent a little bit of another term students might have heard RGB. Red, green, blue, it's becoming a little passe. Um, at this point, I would typically date myself with certain audiences and point out when I was a kid, when we had projector screens, it wasn't one lens, it was three. One was red, one was green, one was blue. Um, so this is kind of falling out of vogue, but it turns out I would point out that computers can represent any color of the rainbow just by combining some red, some green, and some blue. So how much red, how much blue? I might say that the maximum amount of red you can have is 255. It's just a really uh, uh, a pretty big number, and it happens to be the largest number you can represent with 8 bits, bytes as before. So this is like a medium amount of red, medium amount of green, a uh, little bit of blue, that if you combine them together like paint, it might look like this brownish, yellowish splotch. Um, but indeed, that might be what you see in the context of a graphics program. So at this point, we typically invite students to take for granted now that if a computer can only speak zeros and ones, thanks to the electricity coming in and out of it from its battery or the electrical outlet, and from numbers you can get to letters, or from numbers you can get to graphics and colors, surely we can get to fancier things still like videos and such, but we'll get back to that later in the semester. For now, let's just assume that computers can represent their inputs. And equivalently, computers can represent outputs in some way, whether the inputs and outputs are numbers or letters or colors or anything else. But what was that third ingredient to computational thinking, we might ask our students? The, the, well, there's the output, the inputs ultimately becoming outputs, but what's between? What do we have to pass those inputs through? Yeah, so algorithms, a fancy way of saying just a problem solving process, uh, so a black box, if you will. And as an aside, in certain lectures, we'll literally bring a black box, put something into it, and then take something out of it, sort of Julia Child style, so that you see the inputs becoming an output. But for now, we'll just focus on 
what an algorithm actually is. And perhaps the most memorable thing each year for some students who haven't seen it before is to consider this as a problem.、Um, unfortunately, especially at the high school level, this is becoming an increasingly unfamiliar problem.、Um, but this is a really big problem that we're going to try to squeeze a few more years out of because before we're really uh, uh,、um, old.、Um, <laughs> This is, of course, a phone book, we'll say, and let's assume it's the white pages. And there's a whole bunch of humans' names and numbers in here, sorted alphabetically from left to right. And let's say there's about a thousand pages in this phone book. This is a fun opportunity now to solve a problem. Let me search for someone like Mike Smith, deliberately choosing a name that's not quite in the middle of the alphabet so that I can turn the pages at least a few times. Now, I might ask students, is this a correct process or correct algorithm for finding Mike Smith? I start at the beginning and I simply turn the pages. One at a time. This is correct. Yeah, and you might get a little bit of disagreement as students sort of think, well, this is,、uh, that's just stupid. But it is correct. And it's important to distinguish this, we claim, at the start of the semester, because it's one thing for an algorithm or a problem、uh, solving process to be efficient versus correct. So indeed, this is correct. It might take me half an hour to find Mike Smith turning one page at a time. But if, if he is in here, I will stumble across him eventually. But now again, we can return to grade school intuition. I can solve this problem a little more quickly, right? Instead of just counting by ones, I can go two. Four, it's always easier said than physically done. Two, four, <laughs> six, eight. <laughs> And it's twice as fast, arguably. Is it correct? No, it's correct. But、okay. What's that? Unless you're doing something else, you have a 50 50 chance you'll miss it. Yeah, 50 50 chance. Why? Why do you say that? Right. What if Mike Smith is in the middle of the two pages that I'm turning simultaneously? And most students wouldn't necessarily realize this initially, so it's an opportunity to consider oh, right, of course, if Mike is sandwiched between two pages, I might miss him. So we need to fix this. It's not necessarily fundamentally flawed. In fact, you, you humans, intuitively, if you were flipping through two pages at a time and you realized, oop, I missed Mike, would you conclude he's not there? How would you fix this? Go back one page. You might say, if I hit the T section, for instance, I better go back at least one page. So it's fixable. It's not a broken algorithm altogether. We can fix it, or it's not a complete dead end, but it's not necessarily that much more efficient. In fact, what would most reasonable human being do today? In fact, let's ask a reasonable human being.、Uh, <laughs> would anyone be comfortable up coming up, on, up front and solving a, a classic problem on camera? Christian, come on up. So, we have a thousand page problem here that we can only solve once for reasons that will probably become clear. How would you go about finding Mike Smith?、Um, I would open it around half. All right, half. So, it looks like you're in the M section, I will pretend.、Yeah. So, I'd go. You're the actually、auto. in the automobile section.、Yeah. <laughs> so, I'd go to the half of the. Well, that's all fine and good, but do you, are you ever gonna, do you need this other half of the problem?、Uh, I actually don't. Wouldn't it be nice if it were half as big of a problem? So now we can dramatically throw that away. And now it's, <laughs> we do, that's it. we'll be asking for donations after this class. And actually, before you do that, just、okay. so I can、uh, insert some,、uh, some teacher thoughts, physically showing students now the problem is literally half as big, not one page smaller, half as big as it was before is pretty compelling. So now I see the M's and you got the Z's over here. What's next? Mike Smith. I could just do that process again. Okay.、So、I could open it. Roughly in the half of that section. And now I see you're in the T section.、Good. Tear、again. the problem in half again, dramatically throw the half you don't need. And the best thing that ever happens is when a student is so sort of discombobulated that they throw the wrong half of the problem away. <laughs> so it's a fun opportunity to go fix the bug. Okay, so now you're, you're at the T's. Yeah, so now I have the left side, so I'll just go to the half of that side. And at this point, most people are starting to catch on, and so I'll start to accelerate. And I'll say, in long story short, now we find ourselves with just one page left.、Uh, I'll pretend it's this one. And I'll hold up and claim now I just have to examine is Mike Smith on this page or not? And if so, we've indeed found Mike Smith. So, congratulations to Christian for finding Mike Smith. So, we are eager for input as to what other device we can replace this with over time. And in fact, the supply we have. Comes from, I gave a talk at Harvard some months ago, and wonderfully, one of the undergraduate's parents was in the audience who worked at a public library, and they had a huge supply of phone books they no longer wanted, so she kindly shipped them to us. But once those are gone, I think、I'm, we're going to need some new material.、Um, I'm sorry? Oh, I guess we should commit to providing these. <laughs> okay, so noted. 
we will, we will solve this. <laughs> um, so why do we do something like that? So even though the idea itself is dated, it certainly just represents an alphabetized book, which is at least an opportunity to talk with students more visually and to create, we hope, in that very first lecture, this memorable moment. Indeed, at least here at Harvard, at the undergraduate level, where students have grown up and having come out of high school, often thinking and perceiving the computer science classmates they have as sort of the more initiated, the kids that have been programming since they were six or they were 12 years old. There's undoubtedly still, even in 2016, here among a collegiate op population, this fear factor of computer science. You're thinking, I'm not a math person. I'm not a computer person. And what's been so important to us for the past 10 years is to send this message very early on that computer science is not about coding and it's not about especially arcane ideas. It's about familiar ideas and leveraging intuition like we just did to solve problems, both correctly and hopefully all the more efficiently. And so at this point in the conversation, I would give students a glimpse of how we can capture the efficiency of what we just did. And if, again, without sending too much of a message so early on about math, I might just say if we just want to plot this, and this is, for instance, the size of the problem, and I might literally say something like n at this point, just to get students thinking in terms of placeholders or variables. n is the number of pages in the problem. And on the axis here is time. Well, the first algorithm we used, searching one page at a time, has like this straight line relationship that we would call a linear relationship. In other words, for each additional page in the phone book, it takes you one additional page turn, or second, or whatever unit of time you're measuring it. A second page takes a second unit of time. Third page, a third uh, unit of time. So what is the curve or the graph look like for the second algorithm? What's the, the, of the second one being the twosies approach, counting by two. Yeah, so it's instead, it takes, it's a faster algorithm, which means for the same number of pages, it should take me less time. So the relationship is the same, and without caring too much about numbers and the axes here, it's just a lower slope. So that if I've got a phone book with like a thousand pages, with my first algorithm, it might take me this much time, but in my second algorithm by twos, it should take me about half as much time, assuming I also do that bug fix at the very end. But fundamentally, that third algorithm is a little more powerful. And I, I would typically pre-draw this, because I've already realized I've painted myself into a bit of a corner as to how I want to draw this. But the third algorithm has a fundamentally different shape. It's not just straight and lower, but rather it's what we would call logarithmic where there's a curve to it, that the farther out it goes, the lower and lower it seems to be relative to those other numbers. And if that's not obvious at first glance, the question I would ask students is something like, well, if the phone company, like Verizon, next year doubled the number of pages in the phone book, how many more pages would I have to turn to maybe find Mike Smith? If the phone book's not 1,000 pages, but 2,000. In the worst case, Mike is pretty close to the end for whatever reason. So this year it might take me 1,000 page turns or fewer, but next year it might take me 2,000 page turns or fewer if Verizon doubles the size of the phone book. But what about this smarter, third, more intuitive algorithm where I divided, or Christian divided and conquered the problem, splitting it in two again and again, which happens to be called binary search, by meaning two. So binary search means keep flipping something in two or splitting it in two. If Verizon doubles the number of pages in the phone book next year from 1,000 to 2,000 pages, how many additional page turns does Christian need to endure? Just one. He can literally, even if the phone book doubles in size, that's no big deal. He just tears it in half one additional time. So instead of 1,000 additional steps, it's just one. And that's a powerful idea. And I'll defer to some of the online lectures from some of the other demonstrations we do of this in class. One of the algorithms we do, for instance, is have all of the students in the room stand up. We ask them all to think of the number one. So I'm number one. And then we ask them to pair up with anyone else who's still standing. So you now have a whole bunch of students, each of whom is the number one paired up. Then you add them to ask them both to count, uh, to add their numbers together. So now you have pairs of students, each of whom is thinking of the number two. And you have one of them sit down. And if you repeat this process again and again, now having all of the twos pair up so that one sits down and you have four, you're sort of transferring your number to someone else, to someone else, to someone else, so that at the end of the day, half of the students keep sitting down in the room, because you keep pairing, and the last person standing is just 
a single student. Um, here, too, is a wonderful opportunity for bug fixing, since it is a rare thing, especially in our case with 800 students in the room, uh, who are sometimes quite far from each other, who, who also uh, are strain uh, to do arithmetic under social pressure. Um, it's rare that we actually get a correct answer, and that always gets a good chuckle as well. And if you take a look at week zero's videos from this past year, we actually did that with a whole bunch of students. So to come back to where we were, we had this notion of computational thinking, which is a fancy way of saying, and um, this, again, oversimplification for, uh, for classroom purposes, but thinking like a computer, thinking very methodically or thinking very algorithmically and taking inputs and producing outputs in order to solve some problem. So we would typically transition at this point to, damn it, spoiler, uh, we would typically transition at this point, we'll fix that, and something happened here, what do I want? This one. We would typically transition at this point um, to a glimpse at this. We would now make the transition to a verbal discussion and a high level discussion of an algorithm to actual pseudocode. And many students in the room have never seen code before. And we would do this line by line by line. And I would typically steer this conversation so that we get a fairly concise program. As you'll soon see, there's ways of writing more verbose, incorrect programs. But we use this as an opportunity to just introduce sort of some formalities around your thinking, to start to clean up students' thinking from something that was very intuitive, perhaps, but not necessarily succinctly written down. And you can implement this in any number of ways. I just happen to choose this wording. But when I say pick up a phone book, open to middle of a phone book, look at names, I might call these statements or procedures or functions. They're just verbs, like do this. But things get interesting if we now consider what Christian did. If Smith is among the names, you should call Mike if he's on that page. That's what he was presumably thinking. But when he didn't find Mike on the current page, he had to look earlier in the book or later in the book. So we use this as an opportunity to talk about a proverbial fork in the road. You can go one of three directions. Either Mike is there, or he's to the left, or he's to the right. And we have to decide. And what we claim programmers typically do is they use this indentation to make clear that line five only happens if line four is true. And the same for seven and eight with respect to six and so forth. So we're sort of starting to get students thinking or seeing scratch-like code, or C like code at the moment. And we use this as an opportunity ultimately to talk about a loop, albeit in a way that I like this approach, even though we would implement this in code a little differently, using this go to only because it's just so specific as to what you should do. I mean, almost any student can very clearly follow these instructions, but we'll of course see in both Scratch and C other ways syntactically of inducing this notion of a cycle. But at this point, most any student in the room can grok the reality that, OK, verbs, OK, do something, conditions or branches as we call them, and loops, and that's a pretty good point to leave that discussion. We now have formalized that otherwise intuitive algorithm. All right, so now at this point, where might we typically take students? So this is more of an alternative, I would say, to some of this discussion. But I thought I'd bring it up because it resulted in some great fun in the classroom as well. Uh, I slightly spoiled it, but these are potentially mutually exclusive things to do or things to do on different days, perhaps on day i plus one, to reinforce what we just did. And to do this, let me invite, let me think how best to undo the spoiler I just did. And let me have one brave volunteer come on up, if you will. One brave volunteer. OK, one less than brave volunteer. OK, Spencer, come on up. All right, and what we're going to do is this. Um, if everyone here, we should have some scrap paper if folks don't have any. Doug, do we have uh, a whole bunch of paper? Maybe it's in the bag or thereabouts? Uh, bigger would be better. Oh, Arturo has it. So, so Arturo, if you can give everyone a few sheets of paper, like five or so sheets. I'm going to prep Spencer in the meantime here. And what you're going to do is describe to everyone what to draw. Mm -hmm. But you can they will you will see this, they will not. So yes. we'll start in just any, a moment. Any words. Any words you want should suffice. Any words you want. All right. So you'll just need a pen or a pencil. Just five or so each. There's plenty. Doesn't have to be precise. All right. 
So the simple explanation of the challenge at hand is to ascertain just how well the students in the room can follow directions. But put more computationally, the goal is to see how algorithmically someone like Spencer, our brave volunteer, can express himself. Because indeed, we'll quickly find in programming that bugs happen, mistakes happen. If you, the human, take things for granted or make assumptions or aren't super, super explicit as to what you want that device to do. So in this case, all of you are going to play the role of computers, fairly dumb devices who should only do what they are told to do. And Spencer is going to be the programmer, if you will, verbally telling us what to do, where the exercise here is to draw something. So Spencer, uh, let me give you the microphone here. Okay. Yeah, the goal is, and don't raise it too hard because oh, yeah. uh, it's yeah. a little translucent. <laughs> yes. Tell yeah. your students what to do. Okay, so first draw a square. Uh, um, how about this? Does it matter what the size is of it? Uh, yes, but and they might not ask questions. Okay. You, sh you should anticipate the ambiguities. Okay, so I would say draw a square that's about one fourth the size of the paper in area. In s within that square, draw a circle inscribed within the square, such that uh, there's four corners of the circle touching the square, or four parts of the circle, I should say, touching the square. And then from the upper right corner of the square, create a diagonal line to the lower left corner. And then from the upper left corner, create a diagonal line to the lower right corner. And I believe that should be... It. All right. So, so now, <laughs> let me go ahead and uh, can I anonymously grab a few? And uh, okay, let's go here. Let me see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I borrow this yeah, one? Oh, that's no, that's okay. <laughs> This is an opportunity to deliberately kind of seek out ones that are both correct and maybe not so correct so that we can use this as a discussion. I think we've got a good sample here. OK. So now the very first one we see oh. is this one here. So not bad. So we have the square and the circle and the x through it. Uh, here's another one that's got a bit more of a margin around the edge. So already there, you should be realizing, oh, we probably should have told yes. people maybe how far from the edge or how to center it. Yeah. Um, this one, and we'll keep anonymous, but it's always fun to point out ones like this, where something clearly went wrong. <laughs> but of course, there's, it's, it's understandable, uh, given the ambiguity initially. And the actual answer, which most people got pretty close to, was, and I'm gonna, that's the one I spoiled, is this. All right, so pretty good. So let's do uh, one other. Let me okay. call someone else up, if I may. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Would anyone else like to take a, uh, take a pass at this challenge? Who's going to make eye contact accidentally? <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> Come on up. All right, so we have another challenge at hand. Same goal. OK. First. <laughs> this one's deliberately a little harder. So we have uh, Jennifer here is going to walk you through version two. OK. Ready when you are. Yeah. Um, so draw a square. Uh, that's that's oriented as if uh, actually a diamond. Maybe we <laughs> <laughs> Definitely go up first and <laughs> next time. So yeah, draw a diamond. Sorry. Sh sure. In the and center if she happens of the to overhear them and clarify. In the center of the paper. A diamond, and then um, t from the left corner of that, um, so uh, draw a another square that is anchored at the left corner of your original diamond and the bottom corner of your original diamond, going down from there, a square. And then you're going to draw another square that is anchored from the right-hand corner of your original diamond and the bottom which uh, corner of your original diamond. And it is touching your second square. They are sharing a side. 
I'm going to have fun now for collecting these. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to? Uh, so you add? should have, um, you should see three squares. Um, Okay, I'll be right back. Okay, may I? Yep. Thank you. No, no, that's frozen. the frozen. Okay, <laughs> the spinning beach ball. Okay. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Okay, may I? Yeah. All right. Okay, may I as well? Sure. Okay. <laughs> sure. All right. And let me go. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right, so deliberately hard, and this was meant to be version three of three, since I spoiled the first, so in all fairness to Jennifer. So let's take a look at what some folks came up with here. Um, let's see here. So here's one. Okay, here's another. <laughs> And just in case this is version two. <laughs> okay, here's this one. And here's another version two. All right, here's two squares. <laughs> here's an interesting one, as you'll soon see. I think maybe that was, cross this out over here. We'll see. This one's a little house. Uh, little house, another little house. This one is interesting in so far as it can be made into a little something closer to what we're looking for. And so why don't we jump right to the spoiler, which was, this is what you were supposed to have drawn. Thank you. So let's use, <laughs> no, 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 that's good, that's good. So let's use this as a quick moment of uh, opportunity to discuss how else might you have expressed this? What would you, the computer, have preferred to be told here? Yeah. Start by saying, maybe, I mean, of course, no, breakfast, right? but draw a regular uh, hexagon. Draw a regular hexagon. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Now I, I, I didn't even see it that way myself earlier. Now I see that. And then, how else might you, go ahead. And then from the very center of the hexagon, connect to the, you know, I, I might say the oh, bottom yeah. corner, the, the bottom corner, and yeah. skip a quarter. And maybe, yeah. That's good, and you know what? What other people were probably seeing what I was seeing. Yeah, a cube, a cube. So, but even that, you know, it would have been a nice cheat for the the human computers here, because we know presumably what a cube is. But even that's not really precise enough for a computer. So, what might another approach be, especially if you've programmed in maybe in Logo or something like that before? How else might you express this algorithm without getting into assumptions about what shapes are? Yeah. So maybe you could think of this as kind of a marker on a piece of paper, like put your pen at the top middle of the page, then draw a line diagonally down into the left, 45 degrees, or something like that. And you can think of it as a, a piece of art. And maybe it's easy there to get students lost or for students to get lost, but that would be another fundamental way of implementing the algorithm. And so just as I claimed a moment ago that we could find Mike Smith in any number of different ways by writing different pseudocode, already here we have at least three different perspectives on how we might implement the same program. Now, why don't we turn the tables here, put a little more pressure on someone else, if someone else is comfortable coming on up. Coming on up. Yes, Daniel, come on up. So Daniel's going to join us up here. And now, Daniel, what I need you to do is come on over here. We're going to turn the tables a little bit. Daniel will now be the computer, doing only what he is told. Uh, the audience, meanwhile, will be the programmers, so collectively we'll have to provide some instructions. And the only thing okay. here on our system, I'm going to project what they're seeing on the screen, so you should only be facing this way. Okay. No looking at the projector screen. All right, so the programmers collectively in the room should now advise Daniel on how to draw this. Would someone like to offer the first such instruction? Draw a tic-tac-toe. Tic Draw a tic-tac-toe. Within a box. Within a box. Okay. Step three. Okay. And if you want to keep this in your hand, we'll hear you better on camera. What's step three? Yeah. Triangle in the upper left box. 
Triangle in the upper left. Equilateral triangle centered in the upper left box. Pointing up. I think they're willing to accept that. That's close <laughs> enough. <laughs> Step four. Draw a square in the top middle. Draw a square in the top middle. Step five. Circle in the top right. A circle in the top right. Not touching the sides. Not touching the sides. Good clarification. Okay. And you might pause at this point to point out to students, we're kind of allowing Daniel to know what a triangle, what a square, what a circle is. But that's fine because here's another opportunity to mention abstraction. If he now has the notion of a triangle, well, how do you implement a triangle? Maybe it is like dropping a marker down and drawing it as like a, a, a line of ink. But let's just take for granted that he has functionality, a procedure that via which he knows how to draw each of those shapes. So by that logic, let's finish up the rest. What's the next step here? Uh, an hexagon in the left middle. Draw a hexagon in the left middle. Uh, regular regular hexagon. Hexagon. A regular hexagon. Flat side on the top. Flat side on the top. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> <laughs> so we need undo. <laughs> Draw a regular hexagon, right. flat side up. OK, next box. Vertically elongated oval in the very center. Vertically elongated oval in the center. Vertically. Vertically. Nice. Next step. Uh, yeah. Vertically aligned rectangle in the right middle box, not touching the sides. Vertically aligned rectangle. Twice uh, as high as it is wide. Twice as high as it is wide, not touching the sides. Okay. Someone else? Another circle in the lower left. Another circle in the lower left. Same, Same, the Same as the other one. Okay. And then another triangle in the lower middle. Same as the original triangle. Another triangle in the lower middle. Not touching the sides. <laughs> not touching the sides. I was waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> and repeat. Square in the bottom square right. In the bottom right. Square. A square in the bottom right. Repeat the second function. Mm -hmm. All right, and Daniel, if you'd like to now take a look. Almost perfect. Maybe that's just that we got off to a, rusty st a rough start with that triangle. Yeah. But otherwise, <laughs> maybe a big hand for Daniel for following directions so well. Thank you. So they, they, you can do these for quite some time, and it's fun. This is the first time we've actually used these particular drawings. I actually went on Google Images and searched for uh, simple line art shapes to just try to come up with some ideas that you could certainly customize your own. Uh, had we escalated further, this would have been the next one, which I thought might be fun <laughs> as well. Um, and I would say it's very deliberate on our part in CS50, at least, to always choose some warm-up exercises that are very graspable, that the student succeeds early on, and then to choose thereafter more challenging ones, maybe disclaiming verbally that this is going to be harder so that the student when they're invariably embarrassed, it feels OK about it, because the goal is to use it as a teachable moment and to encourage students, certainly, uh, to not fear failure of that sort, especially when it's all in good, lighthearted fun. So toward that end, we thought we'd do one last demonstration that will involve a few volunteers. The goal here is yet another incarnation of how how to follow or not to follow directions. Some of you might have seen this online. Uh, I inherited this one from my fifth grade homeroom teacher who used this as an opportunity to teach us um, how not to follow directions, uh, or conversely, how to follow them correctly. And it's used certainly in other CS courses these days as well. Uh, for this, we need a big table over here. So let me pull this out. Uh, this always requires a trip to the grocery store the morning of. We try to choose, thank you. Uh, we have a, a special bag here. And most fun here, I think, is if we could get three volunteers who have no idea what's about to happen. So if we, OK, so come on up. Let me get you, uh, if you want to roll your chair or one of these over so you have a comfortable place to sit. Uh, I think uh, I saw a hand go up over here. Uh, if the, the young uh, lady in the volunteering over here would like to come up. <laughs> Maybe sit in the middle with a chair, and then a third volunteer who hopefully has no idea what's about to happen to them, with them. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else? I don't want to have to pick another volunteer. 
Maybe someone for, oh, there we go. Thank you so much. All right, roll your chair around if you could. Oh, here we go, third chair. All right, so as you may or may not have guessed, we have an opportunity now to, nope, sorry, make a sandwich, choosing the most sort of canonical looking bread as we can. Uh, so we have three loaves of Wonder Bread here. Uh, we have in this bag um, a few things of peanut butter and jelly. So peanut butter, peanut butter, peanut butter. We have in here as well some jars of uh, strawberry jam. That's okay. PB jam. And there's always, yeah, you know, it's always good to have a corner case <laughs> like this one. Perhaps for someone who's willing to ham it up a bit. And maybe another corner case whereby we have just two knives. <laughs> Though I think that corner case was unintentional. <laughs> so the goal at hand now is to write an algorithm collectively via which to solve a problem. The problem of actually making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I'm going to go ahead and just pull up a little text edit here. And let me, a little spoiler, how to do that. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and be the scribe here as we program together. And I'll invite you, the audience, as the programmers now to direct these three computers who should only do what they are told to do in an executing your program. So what would be the first step of making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Open the bag of bread. Open the bag of bread is what I heard. Then I heard, remove the tag from the bag of bread. The tie. That that was the Step three, the tie. the tie. That's what I meant from remove the tie. I mean, oh, the tie, the tag. <laughs> okay. Third, another corner case. We did, in fact, bring plates that I forgot about. Okay, I heard remove two slices of bread. What's next? <laughs> Open jar of peanut butter. <laughs> but we're taking for granted some things here. I would say put the, put the bread slash next to each other on the plate or the table, whatever you got. I put the slices of bread flat on the table. Next to each other. Uh, Separate. Next to each other separately. Oh, no, we didn't do it this time lest we endanger one of our volunteers. But a uh, fun, ex uh, fun aside, uh, it's to pre-cut the top of the lid because it's always fun for someone to ham it up when someone says, put night. Wait, spoiler. Never mind. <laughs> okay, step six. <laughs> step six. I got ahead of myself. Peel off seal on top of peanut butter. What's that? Mmm, probably. Kind of doing things out of order here. <laughs> All right, so the seal's off the top of the peanut butter. What's next? Put knife in peanut butter. This is the step that often comes a little prematurely, at which point it's fun to just take a not too sharp knife into the lid of the jar. Step eight, after putting knife in peanut butter. Put other utensil in peanut butter. That, oh, I see, for Zamila. Okay. All right, step nine. Remove some peanut butter with knife. With or other utensil. Or other utensil. Remove some peanut butter with knife or other utensil. Bread evenly on top <laughs> slice. So here too, hopefully some students are starting to yell that that is not nearly enough peanut butter. Some is a little ambiguous. Enough to cover one slice. Enough to cover one slice. And also we seem to have not been so precise as to which end of the knife should go into the jar. But that is a good ambiguity. So enough is a little ambiguous, too. <laughs> that is enough to cover the top. All right, what's step 11 going to be? Spread. Oh, they're already spreading. Enjoy. Enjoy. OK. <laughs> Let's see if we can at least close the sandwich. Open jar of jelly. 
Open jar of jelly. Or by twisting with quad clockwise. Or squeeze. Lift, uh, <laughs> okay, container cover. All right, step 12. Twist off cap. Twist off cap. With your fingers. <laughs> With your fingers, 13. If there's, a, if there's a lid, peel it off. If there's a lid, then peel it off. Only one lid for you guys. While jelly is still covered, <laughs> figure, out. figure out how to uncover. Now use your teeth. Now use your teeth. Step 15. If you have a squeezable uh, bottle, uh, replace, uh, replace. replace lid. So we've really had a special case of Mila here. Keep it, keep it open. Keep it. But keep it open. <laughs> Okay, and now st <laughs> almost there. If you have the squeezable container. <laughs> We're really just focusing on Zamila now, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Squeeze <I'm ready>. <laughs> on bread. <laughs> Step 18. Oh. oh. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> if you have a jar. If you have a jar. Pick up knife by handle. Pick up knife by handle. Good, good. <laughs> Step 20. <laughs> insert blade of knife into jelly. So we're not making past mistakes. You're not listening. <laughs> blade. That's a hardware error. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, it's 21. Remove one tablespoon of jelly. Nice. One tablespoon of jelly. And? That doesn't have peanut butter on the top. <laughs> <laughs> Swear. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly. <laughs> I don't know. Do we need another tablespoon? It looks a little light. <laughs> the quality control is not among the objectives <laughs> today. <laughs> and lastly. Thank you. Put two slices. No, I heard put two slices together. With the peanut butter and jelly. Oh, with the peanut butter J inside. Yeah, I'm starving. Uh, <laughs> well, I hear a request now for a sandwich. So a round of applause if we could for our volunteers here. So ultimately we realized we compressed quite a few of these demonstrations all into a, a small block of time. But really to paint the picture that of this is really how we spend the first lecture or two in CS50, the first couple of hours of exposure. We, not once have we looked at actual code, though I'll often show at least one glimpse of some arcane looking C code to help promise students that, hey, in just a few days, you'll soon understand you're eating it. I'm impressed. That has never actually happened. <laughs> um, to paint a picture for students of where they're going to be in just a few days time yeah at the high school level I've had a lot of problems with concern over allergies yeah so that's I've true had to I mean, we actually, we've localized this too. We had students from uh, Brazil once where I forget the name. We, it was pe peanut butter and jelly is not a thing in Brazil. Um, and so we chose a different ingredients for that reason. On stage, we have the example, uh, the um, we keep, students are farther from us, so it's less of an issue, but worth keeping in mind for sure. So let's take a quick glimpse in conclusion here. That's okay, I can tidy that of something that happened just a few weeks ago among the endeavors uh, for CS50's team over the past few months have been to try to connect um, high schools who are all pursuing AP Computer Science principles together. And so the team and I headed to the Browning School in New York City, where we invited four public schools, four private schools to come together for several hours of a CS50 hackathon. And as opposed to putting this at the end of the semester, as we happen to do here on campus, the goal was really to bring students together that were at very different points in the semester by nature of their teachers and their syllabi, but to really just have them have an opportunity to rub shoulders with other classmates, to have some fun with food and candy and pizza and such, but ultimately to work on problem sets. And 
and to write code together in an environment surrounded by a lot of supports with no sense of competitiveness. Everyone was meant to come in and to exit as equals. And what we did, with thanks to CS50's production team, um, was capture some of these memories. So we thought we'd take a quick glimpse at what it was like at the first ever CS50 AP Hackathon in New York. Hello world, my name is David Malin and I'm an instructor for CS50 and we're here in New York City for the first ever CS50 AP Hackathon that's brought together students from some eight schools in the New York greater metro area to sit down for some five hours of the day with food and candy and friends and classmates and teachers and dive into CS50's problem sets. <laughs> My name is Myla. I'm just welcoming about 90 high school students, and they're all super excited about walkthroughs with Zamyla. This is the moment. Tonight is the night. Progressing through the problem sets, and they're all extremely interesting. Making a code and actually seeing it be implemented, pretty awesome. We're so excited to come down here. We get to code, we get to, you know, make these problems that can be beneficial to us in the world. My name is David Malin, and this is CS50 in New York City.